We begin tonight with continuing coverage of the attacks in Charlottesville, Virginia over the weekend. On Saturday, President Trump drew criticism from the left and right alike when he did not name neo-Nazi groups for inciting the attacks. He instead denounced violence, quote, on many sides. Today, he was more specific. Racism is evil, and those who cause violence in its name are criminals and thugs, including the KKK, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other hate groups that are repugnant to everything we hold dear as Americans. We are a nation founded on the truth that all of us are created equal. Those who spread violence in the name of bigotry strike at the very core of America. The fallout from the weekend's violence continued to reverberate around the country today. In Charlottesville, the driver of the suspected vehicle that rammed into a crowd of people appeared in court via video link. And Attorney General Jeff Sessions said this morning the vehicle attack meets the legal definition of domestic terrorism. News Hour producer PJ Tobia was in Charlottesville over the weekend and begins our coverage tonight. <laughs> Protests continued across the country today in Tennessee, a response to the white nationalist rally in Charlottesville over the weekend and in solidarity with those killed and injured. We're here today to send a message to our white brothers and sisters that white supremacy hurts you too. Back in Charlottesville, fallout from the rally continued. In the district court there, a judge ordered 20-year-old James Alex Fields Jr. held without bond on second-degree murder charges. He's accused of ramming his car into a crowd of demonstrators who came out against a white nationalist rally to denounce a Charlottesville city decision to remove a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. The rally included members of the KKK, neo-Nazis, and others. Those who knew him in high school say he professed enthusiasm for Nazi ideology. 32-year-old Heather Hayer of Charlottesville was killed in the attack. 19 others were injured. Her mother spoke outside of her home today. I am extremely proud of my daughter. I'm extremely proud that she stood for what she believed in, that she not only gave mouth to it, but she gave heart to it, she gave soul to it, and now she's given her life to it. Separately, two Virginia state police officers were also killed when their helicopter, which had been monitoring the protest, crashed. Those state troopers were with me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Her page was part of our family. And it was tough yesterday after I left here to drive to, to the base home and to see Amanda and those two beautiful children whose dad is not coming home ever again. Charlottesville's mayor, Michael Siner, called out the rally's organizers. There's a lot of bluster in the alt-right. Um, there's a lot of violence in the alt-right. There's a lot of hate. Siner rejected criticism that the police response was inadequate. There were almost a thousand law enforcement officers on the ground for an operation in a city of 50,000 people. We had descended upon us thousands of people for the initial event. Thank God it wasn't worse. No shots were fired. Um, no other lives were lost. No property was damaged. White nationalist Matthew Heimbach, who leads a small group based in Indiana, helped organize the protest and showed up at the Charlottesville courthouse today. When we spoke yesterday, he called the rally a success and says the white nationalist movement is stronger than ever. If the nationalist community can come together, stand together, and fight together, that we are going to be unstoppable. That our rise, you know, just even going back since I've been involved in this movement, it used to be a rally of 50 guys was very successful. Now we're rallying 1,000, 1,500 people in the streets. Our movement is growing. Heimbach took zero responsibility for an event that led to death and injury. Someone died yesterday because of your rally. I mean, a rally you helped organize, someone's dead from that. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Do you feel at all responsible? Not at all. There would have been no violence whatsoever yesterday if the police had simply done their job and given the leftist protesters their own space to protest, which is their right, and we had been allowed to hold our rally. The left are the ones that were attacking us. Another group that drew people from around the country for the weekend rally, armed right-wing militias known as the Oath Keepers and Three Percenters. They don't share all the beliefs of white nationalist groups calling for racial separations, but do hold some extremist views. The group's leadership said they were there to protect everyone's First Amendment rights. At least one militia group ended up needing protection themselves. 
Earlier this year, NewsHour went inside one of these groups, the Georgia Security Force, a local 3% militia. Chris Hill is their leader. I think what the government gives, the government can take away. If they're providing the security for us, and they can take it away. After this weekend, at least one militia group said it would no longer encourage participants to show up at white nationalist rallies. This morning, the FBI announced that it arrested an Oklahoma man in a sting operation on charges that he tried to detonate what he thought was a 1,000-pound bomb in Oklahoma City on Saturday. 23-year-old Jerry Drake Varnell told an undercover agent he believed in the 3% militia ideology and was inspired by the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. Meanwhile, other cities around the country are considering removing their Confederate statues. And white nationalists say they'll continue to stage large protests to prevent their removal. Hari? PJ, you and our producer Mark Shallot were both there over the weekend. Um, both sides, the, the left and the right that were there, say that this is a turning point. So how is that the, how is that the case? Well, the right-wing white nationalists say it's a turning point because they managed to pull off in what was in their view a successful rally, even though the planned speeches that they had and the actual event formally never really took place. They were able to create all of this chaos uh, in Charlottesville. They were able to get their agenda pushed to the front page of newspapers and, and television news programs. They were able to enter the city, protest, march around with their, with their signs and, uh, and wave their shields and, and get a lot of coverage for their message. And they, they weren't, in, none of them were injured, none of them were really hurt in any way. They feel like they got their message out and it was a, and it was a success. So it's a turning point for them in that they feel like they really know how to do this now. They can organize, get into a city, and, and get out, and get headlines. Mm -hmm. For the left, um, they feel like they're the ones who actually won the day because the white nationalists weren't able to carry out their formal program. They got pushed out of Lee Park, as Mark and I saw. Um, they were routed sort of from the area of battle, if you will. And then they were having a victory march when that terrible, tragic murder by automobile took place. Mm -hmm. So both sides feel that they can claim victory, and both sides will almost certainly become more calcified in their beliefs and a little more outrageous in their rhetoric. How are these people different than the racists that used to march on cities years ago? In many ways, they're not. They're young men. Um, maybe more affluent than in previous generations, but real, the, the real difference now is that they've harnessed the power of social media so that they're able to organize much more quickly, put together sort of lightning strikes of groupings to get together in a place. Um, they can also get their message out to a much broader audience, people who would never have engaged with white nationalists. Previously, if you wanted to hear these kinds of messages, you had to go to you know, some sort of weird bookstore downtown where they sold foreign magazines. Whereas now, on Twitter, bots uh, can be used to, to flood any Twitter stream uh, with their messages of hate. Well, Mark, let's talk a little bit about the presence of the, the, the Antifa, the, the sort of increased presence of folks who are more aggressive in wanting to push back here than the predominantly peaceful counter-protesters that were there. Sure. So, Hari, Antifa has been around at least since the 1980s. Uh, and Antifa is short for anti-fascist. And they've really got, um, they've come to prominence recently in the national conversation because they've been the ones who've been at the forefront of these, uh, at these alt-right rallies. And their message is basically that the only way to confront these groups is by getting in their faces, is by showing up in force and not allowing them to have uh, to have or hold public space. Because um, if you really carry out the rhetoric of white supremacist logic to its end, it's genocide. And they don't think that it's acceptable to allow them to organize. All right. Mark Shala, PJ Tobia, thanks for your reporting this weekend. Thanks, Sorry. We'll take a closer look at the issues coming out of Charlottesville, including the connection between Civil War statues and the current protest movements. And we'll discuss the swell of reaction to President Trump in our Politics Monday segment later in the program.